Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you're participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is DJ Demolet. DJ is professor and director of the Department of General Linguistics and Phonology at the University of Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris. He is a member of the Laboratory of Phonetics and Phonology and of the Labex EFL, so Empirical Foundations of Linguistics. He received his doctorate at the Free Universities of Brussels in the areas of phonetics and phonology with a thesis on the language Mangbetu from the Democratic Republic of Congo. He publishes on several topics such as phonetics, phonology, speech and language of evolution, South American and African languages and ethnomusicology. Please join me in welcoming DJ as he gives his talk, which is titled Distinctive Features and Articulatory Gestures and Phonation Types in Hatsa, Iraku, and Datoga. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, well, I will start immediately. I don't think that there's a lot of other things to say before starting. Uh, just as a quick introduction, uh, well, just one second. Uh, here it is. Uh, what I'm going to present today is the result, uh, I don't know why uh, Richard has disappeared from this presentation, sorry Richard, uh, you were on my screen earlier. Uh, this is the result of uh, field work that has been done this year in February with Martin, Andrew Harvey, Richard Briscombe, Alan Gio and Roland Kissling. and so you can consider that it's a, uh, the kind of early results, uh, I am late in the interpretation of the data, but early results of this uh, field trip. Uh, so Richard, uh, you were on the first presentation. Uh, I will restore your team if we leave it on the, on the web. Okay, so uh, I think most of you know all this, but just as a reminder, we, work, uh, we worked in this area. Uh, which in my opinion is a very fascinating place to study since we have the four main language families of the African continent in a very uh, small area and which uh, raises a number of fascinating questions and I'm going to, I will try to talk a little bit later about that. So Hatsa is here uh, and uh, I will come back to these things. I think everybody knows um, the geography of these languages. So I will not spend a lot of time uh, discussing this thing. Um, so two things, well, Hatsa is a Khoisan and Iraqu is Kushitic. Uh, one of the striking things of these languages is that they have non pulmonic consonants, pick and ejectives in their phonetic and phonologic inventory. Uh, it seems to be various uh, different topics in terms of phonetics and phonology and I will try to show you that it's more related than what most people can think of. So a precise articulatory and acoustic description is necessary to characterize and formalize these consonants in terms of articulatory gestures and distinctive features. I think there's still a lot of things to be uh, discovered and discussed about uh, these sounds. And one of the challenges is to understand the mechanism uh, of the production of these segments and understand how this type of data uh, in a way uh, tests or limits the, or tests the limits of our knowledge on the diversity and function of speech production in languages. And I think all these languages are extremely important, certainly from an Africanistic point of view, but also from a general point of view, because they really make questions and raise questions that uh, I will say the general phonetician and, and person working on speech production are completely unaware. So um, to, well, to, to small point before beginning, uh, I'm of course not the first person uh, to work on this subject. Uh, Bonnie Sands, uh, Ian Madison and Peter Ladefogat uh, did uh, things uh, almost 30 years ago on, on the subject and Bonnie recently published uh, uh, a summary of uh, what is known about Hatsa. Uh, they describe Hatsa with nine clicks while Kirk Miller suggests that there are 12, if I understand well what Kirk Miller has done. Uh, and we might even suggest that there are 13 clicks, but this is uh, an open discussion that we can have later. In fact, clicks have uh, 
two types, uh, sorry, there's a missing word. There are two types of phenomena in clicks. There are the type of clicks and the type of uh, the accompaniment of the clicks. So four types of clicks, uh, bilabial, uh, dental, alveolar, and natural, can be accompanied in a contrastive way by aspirated glottal and nasal features that can sometimes be combined. And if you look at this uh, in this way, a click, for example, can be described as a series of features or a superposition of gestures, for example, nasal, lateral, and aspirated. It is, uh, strictly speaking, from a production point of view, not the combination of various symbols. This is the superimposition of various gestures. And I think this is very important because it uh, raises a number of issues if you want to discuss uh, aspects of articulatory phonology or other things in terms of speech production. From an acoustic point of view, clicks can be described with two features, uh, grave and acute, uh, abrupt, noisy. Uh, this is a proposition that was made some time ago by Tony Trail, and I think this is, in my point of view, and certainly from the acoustic point of view, uh, one of the best that has been done so far. For example, dental and alveolar clicks in Hadza, they are grave and noisy, and in the case of the, the Hadza, it's abrupt. The lateral click is grave and acute. It gives a lot of information, and we will see that later with a number of examples from spectrograms and acoustic data, that it allows to describe quite precisely uh, the clicks in terms of uh, acoustic features. Uh, the description, uh, and this is of course deduced from examination of acoustic spectra taken at the click release, and you will see that uh, very quickly. So the goal of the, today's presentation is to describe Hadza clicks in terms of gestures, and uh, this includes a measure of time, of course. It doesn't mean anything to talk about the gestures uh, if we don't introduce uh, the, time, uh, the time aspect. Uh, we want to check and establish the accompaniments of the different clicks. And one of the interesting questions that we have also that we haven't been very far in, in that question, but that's an important question, is that what are the similarities and differences with the clicks of the Southern Khoisan languages? And we will see, starting from Trail's point of view of describing clicks in terms of acoustic features, that we have a way to compare both, uh, both types of clicks. One of the questions that was open when uh, we went to Tanzania in February is that uh, are they aspirated clicks in Hadza? We want to evaluate the acoustic similarity between clicks and ejectives, and I think there's a lot of things to be said about that. And uh, another thing that has been, in a way, uh, discovered between brackets, but certainly that we became aware of uh, working in the field, is what is the difference between labialized ejectives and labiovelar approximant? Uh, are, for example, if you look at the, I should have superimposed the uh, the this symbol here but if you compare the two are they similar of different gestures and you will see that there are some little surprises around that so what did we do we used uh, every possible uh, instrumental tool so i'm a phonetician basically uh, i'm a linguist too i pretend that phonetics is linguistics even if uh, some people doubt that phonetics is linguistics um, we've been using every possible tool that uh, we use normally in a laboratory to make the studies that we have done. So you have here, I think you could concentrate on this image here, we have uh, a, a tool that's called EVA uh, for Evaluation Vocale Assistée in French that allows us to measure simultaneously when it is possible the acoustics you know, with the microphone here, the oral airflow with the mask that's put here, nasal airflow, and sometimes intraoral pressure. We can connect also an electroglottograph to this uh, device that gives us acoustics, EGG, and three aerodynamic parameters, which give us very nice uh, data to understand how, uh, how this phenomena works. We have the same tool that's presented here. We have also used um, a high-speed camera that allows us to uh, record up to 300 images per second. And I will show you a few examples uh, of data recorded with this camera. And uh, what else? Well, we've done some palatography, but uh, 
personally, I'm not very happy of uh, what I did. I take full responsibility of that. And that some of the data are usable, but I think we should uh, really be part of the data. So if you want to see how we measure phagenic pressure, usually um, I make the demonstration on myself, uh, taking a little tube that you pass the tube to your nose behind the villum, and uh, that allows you to have uh, a measure of phalangeal pressure, which is one of the most robust uh, features that we can have to study speech production. It is not uh, the most uh, joyful thing that you can do in the world, but it doesn't give pain, it doesn't hurt the subject, and usually to be uh, in accordance with uh, standard ethical procedures, uh, we are not allowed to, to, to do that ourselves. So usually I show to the subject how it works. I ask them, uh, do you want to do it? Uh, uh, if they say yes, they try to do it on themselves. And uh, if they feel uncomfortable or they don't want, they want to stop, they stop and uh, we just uh, take only the oral and nasal airflow. So here you have the EGG that most of you probably know. So, um, well, these are uh, some of the phases of the recording. So let's start to look at uh, a small reminder about click articulation. Uh, if you look at the alveolar click uh, production, just as a reminder, you have a double uh, contact, uh, anterior and posterior. During uh, this double contact, you have an expansion of the cavity between the two contacts, which makes that uh, this cavity here increases and pressure goes, uh, becomes negative compared to atmospheric pressure in this cavity. And if you release the front part before the back part, then you do, uh, and you have, uh, in this case, the, the burst of the click appearing. So. Uh, at the release, atmospheric pressure is higher than uh, the, the pressure inside the, the vocal tract. And it's true for all clicks. So to come back of what Trail and, uh, and Rain of Rosen have done, um, if you look at, and I will use that as a base to compare the clicks that we, found, that, that we observe in Hadza with some of the southern uh, um, click uh, languages, you have an articulatory description where you have labial uh, clicks, uh, labial uh, laminal dental, apical alveolar. We have a, a small thing in French that I have to correct here. Uh, apical alveolar lateral and laminal lateral. So this, you have the, the place and uh, the part of the tongue that is involved. And acoustically, uh, we come back to what Tony has done. So you have grave and acute and abrupt and noisy and it nicely helps you to categorize the alveolar click compared to the uh, lateral click and the palatal click compared to the dental click. So it is pretty easy to characterize clicks in, in this way. And uh, the question was, uh, can we do the same thing for Hadza clicks? And you will see that there are uh, at least uh, one, one difference for that. So a click acoustics, Clicks are consonants that have a unique source, as most of you know, uh, it sees the velaric airflow. The result can be a type of impulse source uh, and all noise, uh, since you have uh, acute and, and noisy clicks, uh, these phenomena have a certain duration. And these parameters are filtered by the shapes of the oral cavity, which are associated with each click. And don't worry if you think that it's too obscure, I will concretely uh, demonstrate all these things uh, in a second. The acoustic signatures encode the dimension of the vocal tract as for the consonants, uh, where the acoustic signature particularly encodes those which are in front of the constriction. And in the case of some clicks, it is the cavity posterior to the constriction that is excited, and that explains a number of very interesting TV phenomena uh, about, about clicks. So let's go to some concrete things now. Well, clicks have acoustically two components, an attack transient and an extinction transient. I deliberately use the transient name uh, following a suggestion that was made to me, uh, well, 30 years ago by Tony Trail, uh, because there is a confusion with the term burst. Uh, 
the attack transient is the explosion noise, sometimes called a burst. Uh, but I think it's better to talk, if we strictly speak in terms of acoustics, uh, to, to use the term transient. That makes things easier, and you will understand very quickly why. Uh, this is the, the impulse shape to a change in the shape of the vocal tract. The extinction transient is the noise associated with the turbulent release. So in red here, you have the attack transient, and in blue, you have the extinction transient. The attack transient, if you want, is something like this, and the extinction transient takes some time. Or I exaggerate, I shouldn't do it like that, but uh, this is... This is one way to characterize it. And if you compare the four clicks that we have in ATSA, I have been systematically looking at that uh, recently. Uh, one of the thing, the interesting thing is that if you look at the waveform shape uh, at the release of the ATSA clicks, you have a kind of different patterns. And that will be very important when we will compare clicks with other sounds later. So, for example, the bilabial click uh, that you will hear and see in a second, uh, that is, well, in a way marginal in Hatsa, but it's interesting to look at the way it's produced, uh, is, is a kind of, of noisy release with some kind of aspiration associated to that. This is intake of air in that particular case. The dental click uh, is uh, having this increase and decrease of uh, in the shape of the audio waveform. This is typically uh, an alveolar click, and this is the, 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 the lateral click, which has a sharp uh, release, but takes some, duration, takes some time to be complete, uh, completely extinct. So let's look at uh, a little bit more detail of that, and then we will see a number of works uh, realized in that uh, case. But before that, as I said, I want to discuss about the role of the posterior cavity. If you look at very carefully at this spectrogram, so you have here the audio waveform in blue, and you have the spectrogram on top of that. And if you look at that, you have, uh, in each case, you have a kind of, uh, uh, a, a rising resonance that here that is going uh, that makes a little curve. It's less prominent here, but it's quite obvious here, and it's very frequent. So, why does it happen, and what does it mean? And in fact, it is uh, acoustically something very important to identify the type of click, and also to identify what's come after the click release. So if you have this kind of click here that is dental click, a dental and glottal click, what you have open velum and closed glottis and with some slight frication. So the, uh, the, you have typically this kind of release. You have the velum and the glottis closed here. You have a rather, it's a little bit more flat here, but it, it's not noisy at all compared to that thing here. And the open velum and closed glottis give you a slight frication here. So this is quite typical of these things. And we will now, uh, just in a second, uh, see systematic examples of that. But for the moment, I still give the principles. Three types of accompaniments go with click. You can have laryngeal activity, uh, well, glottal stop, uh, laryngeal, voiceless laryngeal fricative or voice laryngeal fricative. In the oral nasal process, you can have a number of phenomena of this kind, and we just look at now the, the nasal vila that can be voiced or voiceless. You can have some pharyngealization, and you have place and manner of the back release that can be uh, of this kind. So this is uh, uh, symbolized uh, in this position at the back part of the vocal, of the vocal tract. I have done that with uh, a palatal click, but I could have done that uh, with uh, other clicks. One important thing to understand with clicks is that you have a simultaneity of gestures, and it means that you have little co-articulation in the case of clicks. And I think this is an important issue. Uh, I don't want to say that there is no co-articulation in click languages, but there is little co-articulation. I think everybody uh, could agree uh, on that particular point. And what I mentioned earlier, if you make for example, a palatal click, you can make the palatal click simultaneously with the, the 
the, this kind of laryngeal activity, the release can be of this kind, and you can have at the simultaneously to uh, uh, some kind of nasality can be nasal or not. Uh, and so all these things are not sequenced in time, they are simultaneous. And that is an important thing for this. So the anterior articulators, apex and tongue blade, um, we have um, moves at different speed with the clicks. There is a difference between the apical clicks uh, and the lateral click where the tongue blade extends backwards during the production before the release. And I think this, this timing factor is something that is usually neglected, but it's very, very important to understand the number of these phenomena. So the movement of the back of the tongue is slower for aspirated clicks compared to non-aspirated clicks, for example. And uh, it is measurable and it is quite easy to, to, to demonstrate. For noisy clicks, uh, the, the dental, the bilabial, and the lateral click, uh, after releasing the anterior closure, there is an initial increase in loudness, which increases to a peak and then decreases. That is the shape of the audio waveform that I showed you before. And this is a measure of how quickly the anterior part of the tongue moves away from its place of articulation. And again, this has impo very important uh, uh, this is very important to understand the variability of clicks. One of the things that I will not discuss today is the variation in the realization of clicks. And uh, that should be uh, an, another discussion for another day. But um, if you look, for example, we, we, we made recordings with 10 Hadza uh, uh, speakers. And if you look, for example, at the realization of any kind of click made by any of our, our Hadza speakers, if you look at the audio waveform and the spectrogram, you, you could think that uh, this is not the same phenomenon that you are studying. In fact, these are all, for example, lateral or alveolar clicks. And there is a very important thing to understand uh, in terms of variability with clicks. And this is, if you don't take into consideration this timing aspect, this uh, timing and time aspect of the movement of some part of the tongue, you will not understand why the variation is what it is. And by taking that into consideration, what seems random variation becomes quite obvious. So these are for the general things. Uh, Hadza clicks, uh, I am not uh, the the most expert person, of course, to talk in Hadza clicks. I consider myself as a beginner in this area. But uh, for all those of you that uh, want to see data, here are some data. This is an example of the bilabial click. We have dental click that can be glottal, aspirated, nasal, or glottal nasal. Same thing for the alveolar click, and same thing for the lateral click. And here are a number of examples that I took from the, the data that were provided uh, nicely by uh, Andrew and Richard. And uh, I have taken into consideration Kirk Miller's transcription for that. So this is not my invention. I'm just trying to follow what uh, others uh, that I consider more, more expert than me have done before. And so here you have the combination of several clicks uh, in the same world. So let's look at data. I think there's nothing more boring to hear that, uh, than hearing a phonetician talking about general things. So let's look at data. For example, if you listen to the bilabial click here, mm -hmm. this is produced by a man. Look at the upper uh, realization. You have the audio waveform and you have uh, the, the noise at, at the release here. It's a kind of noise band. It takes a little bit of time and it corresponds to the audio waveform that I showed you before. There is one interesting thing that demonstrates uh, that uh, there is an intake of air and that shows you that you have, this is, this is the noise produced by the click, but you have also uh, some kind of whistling effect since the, the lips are not completely pressed at that point uh, in the uh, in, in in the beginning. You have some uh, some harmonics that are present here that typically represent the things when you whistle, and when the the cavity 
uh, increases, you have a lowering effect of the harmonics here. So these are two realizations of the same click in two repetitions produced at a two second intervals by the same speaker. So these are not two different, these are not two different speakers taken at uh, a different moment. So if you look at that from acoustically for, for on a spectrogram, you say, well, these are two different things. It is the same thing. And what we have to understand is exactly what happens. So one way of doing that is to take uh, that with a camera. And here is a realization of the bilevial click. It's easy since it slips and it's external to the vocal track. <laughs> Okay, I think it's pretty easy to, to look at what she's doing. Now, if you look at that uh, with three, three, 300 image per second, you will see the, comp the, the compression of the lips one against of the other and the way the, the, the lips are released. And keep that in mind because we will talk about that a little bit later when we will talk about labial visualized consonant. Pressure. And this is the release. So there is clearly uh, an air intake in that particular case. I can play it once more. Look, uh, she's pressing the lips. And the way it's released is not sharply separating the lips. There is an air intake that's taken at, at that moment. And we have measured that uh, by aerodynamic measurements too. Now, I cannot do that for the other clicks. Uh, there is no camera that we could, that we can put in the vocal tract of people. But if you look at the four types of dental clicks, look again at the shape of the uh, audio waveform that you have for, for the dental clicks. Here is a, a glottal dental click. Go, go. Here is uh, an aspirated dental click. There are even two in the same word. Now you have a nasal glottal uh, dental click. And you have a, a, a nasal dental click. You rem if you remember that, uh, that resonance that you had, this increased resonance that you, we, we have observed before, it's easier to detect when you have a glottal closure following uh, than when the, the, there is an immediate vowel, a vowel immediately following, but it's still uh, detectable quite quite easily in that case. And this typically accounts for the, the resonance in the back cavity uh, at the release of the tongue dorsum. So here is a word where you have in the same word uh, a dental click, a dental glottal click, and uh, dental nasal glottal click uh, and you have uh, even uh, an ejective following and then there is an interesting thing here if you, you keep in mind that kind of shape that you have at the the, dent, uh, the at the ejective release here so another way of looking at that and demonstrating the things that we do uh, is to look at uh, combining uh, different parameters. You can, you have, it is the same word, but we are looking at uh, two types of data. You have the acoustic waveform in green is the same uh, here and here. You have here the all airflow, the air coming out of the mouth. You have the pressure taken in the, vo uh, taken in the vocal tract by a tube passed through the nose. One of the Hadza speakers agreed to do that and we have very good measurements with him and you have here uh, a measure of the electroglottograph that gives you the resistance uh, at the glottis so basically uh, to understand the principle is that when you have a peak the vocal force are in contact and we when you have uh, 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 this part low uh, uh, a low peak the vocal force are open so here is a way to look at that. If you want to, maybe a, one good way to look at that to start, you look at the larynge, voice laryngeal fricative here, you can see on the audio waveform that it's voiced and you can see that the vocal force are vibrating here. So there's these up and down movements. So 
here when you have the the what we call i think stupidly in phonetics in general that is nothing uh, i think it's a century that everybody calls that aspirated and is the country of aspiration in fact but you have this thing here you can you have an opening of the vocal fold that's detectable here uh and you can see that uh, there is a low uh, a negative oral airflow that corresponds to that opening so just to show you that we can very precisely describe the sequence and the timing of articulatory movements by doing that i will make the presentation available to everybody and be happy to discuss with anybody about these things and do more things uh, if you want uh, in the future Let's go to the alveolar click now. Uh, for the alveolar click, uh, this is, I think this is the sexiest click that we can find. So I, I, I love to do that for my students because they, they are very excited when they hear that. Okay, that's pretty obvious. You have, I will say, I call that model because there is no particular complement. Here you have some, some aspiration. Slight aspiration, that's noisy, but you can detect it. You have a glottal alveolar click, oh, yeah. and you have a, a, a nasal alveolar click. Online. So we have that not only in one word, we have that in a number of words. So again, thanks to Andrew and Richard and, and uh, Kirk and uh, Bonnie. I mean, there's a number of data that we have simply been able to record. So we didn't invent these things and we didn't discover the things. We've been just following with some equipment uh, what others have done before us. And it helps to discuss a number of issues like the aspiration and these things. But we can leave it that for the discussion. Again, uh, an alveolar click, a glottal alveolar click combined, uh, combined uh, with some uh, ejectives that we have uh, in Hadza. It's very interesting again to look at the shape of the, the audio waveform when you compare the, the thing here. So if you just compare this one here and this one here, this is a kind of weak realization of this one, but we can come back to that later. Um, so you have the lateral click. This is that's what, what I call the model, and you have here the aspirated. The aspiration is quite obvious in, in, in this case, and you have glottal nasal, and you have again this, you know, increase of the back resonance here, and you have nasal aspirated, and again with this uh, increase here. So, just as the other examples, I combined uh, realization of uh, lateral clicks with uh, an injective in the same word. If you hear it, uh, and if you look at the shape of the audio waveform, there are some um, interesting common features between the two. So again, to illustrate the thing, uh, if you want to have more detail on the coordination of these things, and don't be impressed by phoneticians. Phoneticians like to brag by showing some, uh, some nice data, but uh, in fact, these things are pretty easy to, to 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 understand you just have to take a little bit of time but that helps to to understand how these things are time coordinated and i think for linguistic description in terms of phonetics phonology certainly in terms of phonology and probably for other issues in in the description of the languages it's very important so you have here a lateral aspirated click <coughs> You can even hear the, the, the listen to the resonance of the, the mask the guy had on his mouth. So you have here the in blue here and here you have the oral airflow. In green you have the acoustics. This is the EGG and this is intraoral pressure. So what's interesting for, for us now is this particular thing here. If you have what we call aspiration, you have negative airflow, and you can see that there is a uh, uh, a, a lowering, a, a, a low movement of the EDG waveform. So this is a phase where here the, the, voc the, the vocal folds go in contact, 
and the, the contact is gradually released and you have a wide opening that accounts for the negative airflow that you have here. It's even easier to look at here, in fact. So all these things can be precisely described by using the equipment that we have been using. And the goal is to help to refine uh, the descriptions of the phenomena that we study in these languages. One, just one slide about that in passing that is very interesting is that clicks, if you look at that from the production point of view, it is a kind of a biomechanical movement uh, similar to swallowing. And the inverse movement of swallowing is what we found with ejectives. So at least from the biomechanics, there is a link between uh, clicks and ejectives. And you will see a little bit later, I think that we, we can say probably more than that uh, based on the data that we have been recording. So in fact, clicks would be in that case, and eject is also new use of movements initially not intended for speech. This is for long historical perspective that don't interest people who describe languages, but that helps us to understand how these things are working and why some of the things happen. So you have in that case, a kind of uh, specialization of movements for communication purposes. And if you want to look at externally at click movements, we have one of, the, of our Hadza uh, friends that uh, participated in the experiments. He has the, the all airflow mask on his mouth and you have the EGG here. And look, uh, it, is, it is a beautiful example of the vertical movements of the larynx, the going up and down that we found with clicks and ejective. Listen to that. I'm by Mekufa Nindogo Hintri. Secondly, Kugusa. So the, the very interesting thing in here is that um, it is not very common to be able to show this kind of data because with the Iraqi speakers that we've been recording in the same field trip, usually what was going on is that the larynx of the person was moved, the, the, the EGG electrodes were staying in place and the larynx was going uh, up and down, but that was not moving. In that particular case, uh, there was a common movement between the EGG and the, the larynx. This is the thyroid cartilage. And that gives us an idea of what happens in the vertical movements of clicks and ejectives that you can study very precisely if you want to do that. So coming back to the trail data for the acoustics, um, you have the five clicks that you have in Kong, uh, in Kong sorry. Uh, so these are based on this kind of spectral analysis that was done by Tony Trail. And Tony made this description of uh, abrupt and high frequency, so abrupt and acute, if you want, uh, by uh, looking at the spectra that we have here. For example, if you want to look at the alveolar click, it is considered as uh, a non-abrupt or a grave click. And you have, uh, for example, the lateral uh, and the palatal click that are considered as uh, acute or high frequency click because there, is, there are higher frequencies during their production. And so we come back now to the, one of the questions that I had at the beginning of this talk. Um, this is the comparison between uh, the Kong the, and the Hadza click. Uh, and what interests us is the red, the things that are underlined in red here. So if you look at the dental and the lateral click that we have uh, in, the, in the, the language that was studied by Tony, and we have the, the Hadza click, the, the, the lateral click is non-abrupt and it's, it's grave, uh, it's non-high frequency if you want. And in Hadza, we have an abrupt and high frequency click. And how do we explain this difference between the dental and the lateral clicks of the two languages? One possible way to explain that, and I think that mechanically it makes complete sense, is to say that the lateral click could be a lateral version of the palatal click. 
And so historically, we could have that kind of process that should have that should be demonstration by demonstrated, sorry, by comparative data. But certainly, this is one point that we could look at. But acoustically, there is a difference between the lateral click that we found in southern Khoisan languages and in Hadza. And that is an interesting issue to, to, to look at. And we have more work to do that. What we can do to, to look at that uh, is to compare, for example, dental and lateral clicks. I will make some comparison and show you what we can do to understand that. Thing. So here you have a dental click. Okay. And you have a, 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 a glottal nasal, and this one is glottal nasal too. I forgot to, to write it. So you have dental, uh, glottal, and nasal, and you have uh, lateral, uh, glottal, and nasal. In the two cases, remember this shape that we had on the audio waveform here is rising, falling, and you have a kind of band noise in the thing here. The peak in frequency is slow. Don't, don't worry about uh, technical details. I mean, this is just enough to look at that uh, for what it shows. So the red line here shows that you have a peak around 1000 Hertz and here, here you have between 3000 and 400 Hertz. So this one is high frequency and this one is low frequency and that corresponds to what we have here. So low, uh, non-abrupt and grave and you have uh, abrupt and non-grave, and that is exactly what we, we have here. So if you look at that, for example, the aspirated dental uh, and the click that we, and the, uh, I should have also put that here, um, the, the dental aspirated and the later, lateral aspirated. Oh, sir. Okay. Again, you have low frequency emphasis and high frequency emphasis that acoustically make the difference. And again, look at the shape of the, of, the, of the release on the waveform. And there is some conclusion to be taken about that. And if you look at the alveolar click, for example, you have um, in the two cases that we have here, and this one, the emphasis is on low frequency. It's just slightly, it's above 1000, but below 2000 and it's around 2000 Hertz. And just to finish, and that is uh, on, on the clicks, this is alveolar and lateral clicks. For example, if you look at that, and you have this one, so you have the alveolar click with the glottal release, and you have the lateral click that is nasalized, I agree, with, with, the glottal, uh, with the glottal release, you have low emphasis uh, in terms of frequency, which is abrupt, with a short and colored noise. The coloring of the noise is these two uh, resonances that you have here. And you have here the lateral click that is considered as a high frequency with what we call a band noise. So the, the noise has some duration. That's basically what is called a band noise in terms of acoustics. So to sum up these things, uh, we can, I measure that with about 50, reali uh, well, 45 realizations, sorry, uh, for every click uh, that we have been recording for Hadza speakers. For example, for the alveolar, it's grave and abrupt because abrupt because it's short, grave because you have low frequency, you have, uh, you have grave and noisy, which is this kind of, I was about to say random, but it's not. Uh, it's not allowed to say that. But you see that there is no space. There is no real peak uh, for the bilabial. You have an acute and abrupt click for the lateral. Uh, this is much higher frequency when you compare to that the alveolar, and grave and noisy for for for, for the dental click. And that patterns quite nicely uh, across speakers, across women and across men when that we have been recording, recording for the Hadza speakers. So there are some, uh, some pattern appearing if you look systematically at the data uh, for the Hadza clicks. So to sum up that, we can do the same kind of thing that uh, Trailer had done for the, uh, we don't have the uh, palatal click in, uh, in Hadza, but we have the same kind of thing, place of articulation, uh, the place of articulation and the type of uh, articulator involved. And acoustically, we have again, the, the opposition between grave and acute, abrupt and noisy. 
and that pattern is quite nice. But for the fact that this is completely different from the, the description of the of the southern uh, African cliques. So just one more point, and then I will turn to Iraq very quickly and, and some interesting thing for data, uh, for datoga, sorry. The back of the tongue moves away more slowly from the velum with the aspirated clicks compared to the non-aspirated one. We can measure that on the click release. Any future interpretation that would distinguish this sound simply in terms of the state of the glottis doesn't, uh, is not completely adequate. That is what it means. All the segments discussed require to account very precisely for the relative coordination of articulatory movements, the adjustments of the larynx and the movements of the velum, which control nasal flow. And these coordination specifications are not di uh, directly related with phonological future. And that is the point where I wanted to take you. You can take the, the technical detail for, for what they are, if you are interested or not by this. But I think there is, there is no better demonstration that the coordination specification that we observe for the phonetics of clicks uh, in, uh, in Hatsa is not related to phonological future usually used. And that is something that we should be aware of. It's not a way to say phoneticians are right and phonologists are wrong. It is just to say that it is incredibly more complicated than what we can think of. It has important consequences for historical perspective and it has important perspective if we want to compare languages with one or, one or, or the other. And I think there is a huge field to be explored that is virtually not explored at all. And the contribution of these languages, both in terms of general, generalities and uh, specific things of Khoisan languages and languages of the area uh, are, are, you know, are important to look at. Sorry, I'm, I'm mixing things now, but I think this is very important to look at, at this, this issue because um, Tony Trail in, in a paper that he had done in 1980 with people at the Fulham was already observing this kind of stuff. And they were both saying, we have nothing to say about that, but that should be explored. We are now almost 50 years after and we still haven't said anything about it. And I think that by looking, by relying on what people do in the field, what phonetician can look at by putting everything together, we can start to look at these things that will bring better descriptions and better understanding of the speech production mechanism in humans. That's the way I, I view the things. So to conclude links between clicks and adjectives, um, one of the observations that we have done is that the lateral click has a similar articulation to that of the parallel lateral adjective that you have in Hatsa. And this uh, palatal lateral adjective in Hatsa uh, is, the, is in fact a variant of uh, the, the, the lateral click that you have in Iraq. So there is a clear relation between the, the two. And for example, if you look at uh, the correspondence with a dental glottal click and uh, the affricated alveolar adjective, the click has velar initiation and the adjective is produced with the glottalic initiation. And this is, relates this idea that you have swallowing type of movement for clicks and ejective type of movement. And by understanding how these things are working biomechanically, it suddenly makes sense to look at things that you say, well, this is, a, this is an ejective, this is a click that has nothing to do. In fact, it has. And the better we understand how it works, the better we understand uh, how this variation pattern uh, in these languages. And so if you look at just one example, no more than that, if you look at the coordination, uh, at the comparison between the lateral click here and you have the, the lateral uh, ejective that you have here, this is an Hadza example, look at the, the shape of the audio waveform in both cases. It is a little bit sharper for the lateral compared to the adjective, but it's the same pattern. And uh, there is this, uh, a, a slight emphasis in frequencies between 3000 and 400 Hertz for the lateral click that is not uh, present with the adjective because the adjective is a kind of, this is not correct what I'm going to say, but just to make myself understand, 
it is a kind of weaker realization of the creed. Listen to that. So there, is, there, are, there are some uh, acoustic similarities between the two, and there are also articulatory similarities. So uh, since Martin was with us, we couldn't avoid to look at uh, things in Iraku, and I'm going to do very quickly because I don't want to, to, to take too much time. Um, I will concentrate now on realization of the, uh, the lateral uh, ejective that we have here. And here are a number of examples. So for example, if you look at uh, the, the realization that you have here and the realization that you have here, one of the striking features that we found with this uh, ejective in Iraku is that there are, there are a lot of variation to be observed. Sometimes we have a sharp release that is what we, hear, we expect for a click. Sometimes the fricated part is very long as it is the case here. And sometimes you have a duration that is even between the two things. But there is a lot of variability, but it's still the same phonological category. So again, it's important to understand the variability that we observe uh, in these things. So here it is. We can hear that there is a, a kind of prominence of, uh, of the fricated part. And we can look at that uh, with uh, internal uh, air pressure taken by a tube uh, passed to the nose. All Iraqi speakers did that. Uh, they were heroic uh, and they should uh, be acknowledged for that. Uh, so these are two realizations of the world by the same speaker. And here there are, I, I have to say that there are things that I cannot explain and that we still have to understand. If we look at, for example, we have uh, internal pressure during this ejective uh, reach, uh, it goes above 330 hectopascal, which is about three times the value of what we could say a stop in English or in French or in Dutch. And uh, this is one of the thing. The second thing uh, that has to be observed when you have ejectives, you have this kind of ballistic trajectory. It, instead of having a kind of square, uh, a rectangular uh, increase, plateau and decrease, you have the larynx goes up, reach uh, its higher point, and then it gradually goes down. This is a very typical signature of what we have for ejectives. The other thing that I cannot explain is this. When we have this negative peak uh, in, uh, EGG, in the EGG, that probably corresponds to some kind of movement that we have with the larynx that uh, I've been trying been trying to explain but i have no explanation to be honest and so there's a lot of things that uh, the iraku uh, is bringing that we we have to look at more carefully that corresponds to the uh, uh, uh pharyngeal part uh, i think yeah if we listen to that there is a slight pharyngealization here maybe it's correspond to that but we have to look at that more carefully. Look at another realization of this uh, of this adjective. You have here a weak freak, a weaker frication, a, a, a sharp release, and we don't have at all the same uh, acoustic signature for the fricated part. Um, look at the next uh, realization that we have here. Again, there is uh, a slight frication that is done in maybe in, even in several phases, but that's the same speaker and that is doing that completely differently in, in intervocalic position. Again, we have surprises, uh, negative peak of uh, on the EGG signal here. These are absolutely systematic phenomena. So if we have that for one realization in one speaker, Okay, that could be random, that could be idiosyncratic, whatever. But if you have that systematically with the same speaker, and then again with across speakers, there is something to be explained. And we have been observing that for uh, Hatsa in, in all the realization of these kind of ejectives. And I have no explanation for that for the moment. If someone has someone something to propose, I would be very happy to discuss that. 
look at uh, this kind of realization that we have here work finally for this adjective here. It's weak, but nobody describing the language will doubt that this is this uh, affricated uh, lateral adjective. So what I wanted to show you is that word initially, intervocalically, and word finally, this uh, affricated lateral adjective are real, can be realized completely differently. Again, we can show that it is ejective by looking at the intro, uh, the shape of the intraoral pressure, by the peak of intraoral pressure that is in this case twice higher than what we expect for normal stops. If you look at the EGG waveform, there's also something systematic that uh, we still have to work on. And look at this is the example that I would use for a class, for example, to, to demonstrate that you have lateral affricated ejective. The only problem is that you have a sharp release for the, the, the stop part, but the, the, the fricated part is very, uh, is very small. So everything that I was personally expecting for this nice and exciting uh, lateral ejective sounds um, had put me uh, in trouble because it's much, much more variable uh, across speakers, men, women, and context than everything that I could have expected. And again, it has to be to be explained. So to finish, I'm going to show you uh, two things very, very quickly. The first thing is that thing that, uh, in fact, this is Martin by chance, by chance, mentioned to me the story of labialized consonants uh, in Iraku. And you have one example where you have a uvula uh, ejective with a fricated release, but it's uh, labialized. So listen to that. Fat. Fat. Okay, so the point here is that, that we have been observed and I'm making a generalization of something that we have been observing in a number of realization across speakers is the following. Is this jet gesture of labialized consonants different for the, the labial gesture that we have with, for example, M or uh, the approximant? Look at that from the realization. Here we have, I think it is the same word. No, this is not. Uh, yeah, this is the same word that we have here. But this, this is a woman speaking now. So I prefer to show women than, than men uh, in that case. So the lips, look at the shape of the lip and the lip movement. We have the lip frontally and laterally here. We just put a, a mirror at uh, an ang about 45 degrees angle from, from the face. And that allows you to record simultaneously the lip movement here and the lip movement here. So look at that. Um, um, um. So one, once again, look at the way the lips are, are, are um, uh, shaped for the production of this sound. Um, um, um. Okay. Now look at the way lips are configured when they produce a labial villa approximant and, and, and a bilabial uh, stop. One more, one more, one more. So if I tell you that she is produced, uh, there is some kind of lip protrusion and the release of the lip is completely different in that case. One more, one more, one more. Okay, so once again, if we come back to a quick example of a labialized stop here, look at the way the, the, the release of the, of the stop is made. La quanti, la quanti, la quanti. When you have labiofilar approximants and we when you have labialized consonants, there are two different gestures. In labiofilar approximants and bilabial nasal, for example, you have a lip rounding and lip protrusion. And in the case of labialized, in that case, you can vertical opening and closure movement, but there is no protrusion in that case. And these are two different lip gestures, and it is not again without the consequences for diachronical and variation process. But that's something that we could leave for the discussion. And just to finish and to praise uh, 
what uh, Roland Kisting has offered to us to look at in, in that organ. Uh, I think that uh, Roland, and, and Roland uh, I don't know if he's here today, but certainly there is something very exciting that he has uh, that appears from that organ. Look at that. We have found that there are realization of creaky syllables. Maybe it is morphemes. Uh, I don't know enough about Datoga for that. And I know when we discussed that with uh, Roland, uh, that he was perturbated by that. But look, listen to that. Uh, this vowel here is clearly creaky. And you can see that on the up and down realization that you have on the EDG waveform. So, okay, we could say, oh, that is an old man. This is idiosyncratic. Uh, so there's, there, there is no importance. Well, look at that. He has put another syllable at the end of the word here. So this syllable is creaky and the following is not. So, Maybe it's linked to the realization of a tone or pitch or whatever, but there is something to be explained in that particular case. And these creaky phenomena are rather subtle, but they are very interesting to look at. And for all those working on phonation types and, and these kind of things, I think there's a lot to, to be done on that and it's pretty easy to do. So this is the same word Gomukuneni that we have uh, here, but we have added to the oral airflow and I think I can pass this one. So I spoke uh, enough now, I think I should stop here. So that was, uh, or since we are French, uh, Alain Guillaume and I are coming from France, we love to work on in front of, uh, of a pub uh, giving us uh, some uh, publicity like that. And so uh, thank you for listening to us. And uh, I hope that uh, I have interested you and I'm ready to hear, to, to answer to any kind of question that you have now. Thank you very much, DJ, for your presentation. I think we can now begin the question and answer section. The question and answer section will be open to voice questions as well as written ones. So if you would like to ask a question, just raise your hands in the non-verbal controls present underneath the participant panel, and I will send you a request to unmute. If you prefer to ask a written question that's also still possible, you can do so using the Zoom chat module. And as usual, I will read out the question. Please remember that the webinars are being recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording as will the uh, video recording um, and will be released on the YouTube channel. Uh, and then with that, I'll see. I see that there's a question from Bonnie Sant, so I'll ask her to unmute. Speak, Bonnie. Thank you, DDA. Thanks for all this great data. I, you know, I especially appreciate the uh, video of the larynx movement because I've noticed that myself uh, anecdotally, but have never tried to quantify that. And I think I agree with you that that is really a characteristic of clicks that's gone unnoticed, undescribed, and this probably has phonological consequences. And I also wanted, oh, did, did I just lose? No, no, you're still there. Oh, the video went away, so I thought maybe yeah. my, I lost my internet. Um, those harmonics on the bilabial click, I've never seen that before. In Mu has bilabial clicks contrastively, but I've never seen that kind of whistle-like structure. You that know, was very I was very surprised to look at that too, but that, uh, that made me very happy because in the discussion that we had with Martin about the way lips are released, uh, between the labial villas and the clicks and the things. So it goes back to an old idea that was set forward by Yen and Peter, if I remember well, in their book, The Sounds of the World's Languages. They were saying that there were two different uh, lip gestures, one that mm -hmm. was vertical compression and opening, and the other one rounding and protrusion, and that could be contrastive. Um, if uh, the, the, it's just a question of timing and uh, the way of compression. And uh, we recorded uh, all the speakers with the bilabial clicks. And at least for uh, every speaker, I have at least a couple of realization of this whistling uh, thing for the bilabial click that nicely demonstrate that you have a kind of whistling intake, if, I, if we agree. 
And I don't want to dominate the question time too much, but if we could go back and look at the trail and Fossen diagram with the uh, the noisy versus abrupt, just for a second. Yeah. I don't know if you can show that can, while I'm. Uh, yeah, I will put that. So uh, everybody can look uh, at this that. Once again, this one here. So I have to share the screen. Just one second, Bonnie. Uh, okay. Uh, this this one. Uh, actually. Yeah, if you could go back to the one where you have the Hadza clicks, uh, it was a little later. Yeah, uh, where you show that they're lacking. Okay, this one. Yeah. Okay, so we have that gap with the palatal click, and that's a really interesting suggestion that the lateral could be a version of the palatal, because when we do have uh, fricated palatals, they I heard them as lateral clicks, fricated palatals, Nikoka kung. I just heard them as lateral clicks. They are different, but that was my first impression. But what I want to point out here is, so we have this gap in the Hadza system, and compared to other click languages, the lateral click in Hadza is more acute than cross-linguistically. Usually the lateral click has more of a, a slow onset, a yeah. slow rise time to peak amplitude. And then the exclamation point click, the alveolar click, that, that is also less grave than cross-linguistically. It's closer acoustically to the palatal click in other languages. It's not as, as dark sounding. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I guess you could talk about some sort of dispersion theory or something like that for accounting for the uh, phonetic realization of these. But I, I definitely uh, second your suggestion that uh, there's a lot of interest here to phonology that's not being uh, exploited really because in oh, the world of click studies, we're just trying to get the bare bones down instead of getting all this variation and all this yeah. uh, interesting well, stuff. One of the things that comes out from this trip is that, uh, and we, uh, as I said, I'm ready to share that I'm so, I have been ill and, and I'm lazy too. That's why I'm so late. But um, the thing is that uh, I think that if you look at the click realizations between speakers uh, compare men and women, uh, I'm sometimes feeling very uncomfortable. I said, well, is it really the same phenomenon that we are measuring? So there's mm -hmm. probably a lot to be discovered by looking at the variation as you just mentioned. Okay, well, rather than me keep talking, I'll let somebody else ask a question. Yeah. Well, it's also a pleasure to talk to you, Bonnie. Everybody's down and sleeping now. DJ, it's Alan. Can yes. you hear me? Yeah, okay. I got a question about uh, this feature about uh, noisy and um, abrupt. Is it the same idea of the of the feature compact diffuse or, or is it a different is it the same the same phenomenon but with another uh, terminology or is it is it another uh, characteristic in phonetics? Well, you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I have never thought of it. Uh... I just, uh, we, we should go back to this Fant Jacobson and Halley yeah. stuff to see what they specify. I just rely on what Tony and Peter had done on, and Tony and Reiner had done that and the discussion that we had with uh, Peter that I forgot about that. But uh, mm -hmm. maybe we should go back to this compact and diffuse discussion. Mm -hmm. See okay. if they mean the same thing, I'm not sure. Okay. Because uh, as, uh, if you can see on the on the spectrum, uh, it seems to be uh, uh, so noisy. Seems to be like diffuse and uh, yeah. and abrupt. Seems to be compact. Maybe so. It seems to be the same uh, same idea. So I, I didn't yeah. know if it's it's just a question of um, what can I say? Uh, so a no, real difference, or is it quite the same phenomenon? I don't know. I don't. I have yeah. no I, idea. I have no idea. I have to check. Yeah. It's a, it's okay. a good remark. But I would rather rely on what Peter Ladefoget and the Tony Trill have done that I think that were more accurate than uh, certainly Jacobson. I will not criticize Gunnar Fan, but I okay. believe more Peter and uh, Tony than uh, uh, Maurice Halley and uh, Roman Jacobson for that stuff. If I can criticize Roman Jacobson and, and Maurice <laughs> Halley, of course. Okay. Thanks.
Thank you, then I see a comment in the chat, which I will read out. It's from Roland Kiesling. He says, thanks a lot, DJ, for the stimulating measurements of Datoga. I think we should check correlation of the creaky voice with at least two other parameters, uh, meaning ATR and tone. I, he doesn't have many transcriptions straight at hand, but it seems as if the examples uh, to present, the tone is low and the vowel is from the plus ATR set, at least phonologically. ATR and tone, that would be very exciting, Roland. Uh, there was something in Lango, uh, it's a language from Uganda, and some of these Central Sudanic languages that we have in, uh, in Congo had with minus ATR vowels, some slight creakiness that, uh, that was observed. So that would go, but that goes with a low tone too. Uh, so that, that completely makes sense, your, your remark uh, about that. But the thing is that uh, the tone is slow and the vowel is from the plus ATR set, at least phonologically. But then it would associate uh, creakiness with low tone rather than with uh, minus ATR vowels. Why not? Do you agree? I would certainly be happy to, 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 to make some further investigation on, on, on that thing, but uh, what you showed me and what we showed us, uh, or the data that we recorded are so systematic in, in that thing that there is certainly something to look at and that make uh, the things quite exciting to, to, to investigate it, to investigate with more speakers. And it's not that difficult to do because we could do this just acoustically and with an EGG machine, which makes the things quite easy to do. In fact, it's easier to do than stick a tube in the nose of someone, of course. Okay. Then I think I saw a raised hand from Bonnie Sands again, but I think it has gone down again. Well, I, I was trying to remember. I thought it was Trubetskoy who had taken the idea from Beach, who wrote about uh, Nama clicks in the 30s, uh, who might have started with the Grav, the whole acoustic features. But I'm, I'm trying to look up the reference here. So that may have been where Jakobsen took the idea from. So it's we start with clicks and then we circle around back to clicks in the end. I, <laughs> just uh, when you look at the history of phonetics, clicks have been there right from the very start. Yeah. And I think they will continue to be important that way. Certainly. So thank you. I think those are all the questions and comments for today. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley uh, webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Um, so this is the last Rift Valley Net, uh, work webinar of 2020. Um, so we'll be back after the Christmas break uh, and when the first webinar will start on January the 13th. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank DJ again for his presentation, of course, everyone else for participating today, and I hope to see you again next year.